Welcome back to the first Celtic Exchange Weekly of the new season. This is Tino. Tonight I'm joined by a full house of James, Paddy and Muff as we once again cover all things Celtic. Muff Celtic opened the campaign with a 4-0 win over Kelly and already we find ourselves top of the table. What did you make of that on Sunday? Well Tino, well Paddy, well James. <laughs> well, it's the first time it's been a full house in a while, isn't it? Is it? Mostly because of you. Well, well, I, the boy, I, the boys mainly because there, of me taking holidays and all that. Um, <laughs> what did I make of it? Absolutely fantastic and a continuation of the pre-season form which doesn't always necessarily happen um, and against a, a Kelly side that were you know, up to speed or, or certainly should have been up to speed uh, we chuckle at McInnes saying you know, thought the 4-0 scoreline was harsh and that they were in, in the game and things like that and just stuff that comes out of that guy's mouth I, I, I don't I, I, I wouldn't like to think he believes it no, I, I think it's just platitudes said at the end of the game without any thought and just goes onto the team bus so um, made them look a wee bit silly I thought but overall I think the vast majority of Celtic fans I've, I've spoken to are absolutely buzzing with the way the team played you know there's a lot of noise about loads of other things which I'm sure we'll cover off Yeah. but why do we go to Celtic Park to see the team play and are you happy with what you're seeing I, I don't think there's many Celtic fans that will say they're not right now yeah I agree with that Paddy big part of the day was the the pre-match stuff you know flag day is always quite a, a special day at Celtic Park not to be taken for granted at all uh, full stadium display pretty impressive you know great effort by all concerned there and Jim Craig coming out with his wife to raise the, the championship flag it was all pretty special wasn't it it was yeah I think um, just for for me like the, the effort made by the um, the North Curve and Obviously, the, the boys included in that as well. There just to, to make sure that it was a, a an incredible stadium display again. Um, I think a, a massive well done to them for that. I think uh, Jim Craig coming out just just nice to see. They actually kept it pretty quiet this year in terms of how it was going to be. Um, I think uh, it was a, just just nice to see that it was one of our our, our Lisbon lines and uh, just a good way to kick off the season. Also, Danny McGrain doing the the half time draw too. Um, so yeah, just. A nice day at Celtic Park. Also seen on uh, social media that a few uh, familiar faces were there as well. Scott Brown being one as well. So uh, it was good. Um, a good feel. A uh, good feel about the the place yesterday. Definitely. Absolutely, James. You and I done the the post match uh, last night. Various guys stood out. Nicholas Kuhn, Rio Hatati, Kyogo, Matt O'Reilly, and we'll, we'll touch on Matt O'Reilly's situation in a wee bit. Um, but who was the main man for you? Who did you really enjoy seeing? Most folk have gone with Rio, but I, I thought Kuhn, um, maybe it's just because he's picking up the form I thought he was going to come into the season with. Um, I, I think he's got great potential, you know, and he's given us that something we've been missing. You know, bad, we saw from a bad in, in fits and starts as much as I loved a bad in his, his, his numbers. Going past guys and coming inside wasn't necessarily his thing. He was just at the right place, right time. He always knew where to be and, and when to be there. Kuhn is a bit more get past these guy and just tearing down the wing like just what gets you off your seat in a winger so couldn't for me but a notable mentions to Rio Hitati Matt O'Reilly Callum McGregor Kyogo there was plenty yesterday Paddy did you clock that turn of pace from Kuhn in the second half where he just blew down the right hand side yeah I think um, I, I agree with, with James on that I think Hitati Hitati's looking really really sharp but um, I'm excited about Nicholas Kuhn I think yeah. I think a lot of Celtic fans are especially after the performance in the Man City game in pre-season um, he's feeling good about himself I actually think he had a lot of work to do yesterday because it kind of looked like Kilmarnock were trying to keep Alistair Johnson quiet and trying to come in down uh, out, out the right hand side um, but when the ball was getting out to him and um, I think we were a little bit delayed with that in the first half but the second half he, he was he was excellent I thought he played really well I think Nicholas Coon and Alistair Johnson could you know make for a very good partnership then they're just two very decent players and Coon obviously shown much more right now about what he's all about Muff what if Kyogo Furuhashi gets injured in training tomorrow? It's a problem uh, especially given that how uh, you know who he's thinking of no, I'm not. I was suggesting yesterday that oh, you, you I, should. I, have, I, after I, after the agenda here, <laughs> after the hour mark, a loaded got, question. You've I'm got not mentioning his name. <laughs> we can go on with him. <laughs> you've got to be careful. I was suggesting put Louis Palmer up top or anybody. Right, James is obviously referencing Mikey Johnston. You should have put anybody at centre forward at three 0 up to protect Kyogo. I, I thought that was a bit of a naive move. And who am I to tell Brendan Rodgers about coaching and stuff? But in the 85th minute, Kyogo gets cemented by the goalie. If he stays down and he's in trouble, you've got a real situation going into next week. Listen, I, I, I don't get much right now about the squad management. I, 
I actually find it quite insulting. We'll cover it all in section two. I find it quite insulting. Um, I think many fans do. But on the subject of Kyogo, he looked immense yeah. yesterday. And I think just the, you know, there's been a few rumblings about him. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he's changed agent, you've seen over, that over the, the summer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've still, got, we've still got a couple of weeks to go, so those, those fears... Uh, could still yet be realised, unfortunately. But just looking at looking at even how he's been pre season and how involved he's been in the play, and how sharp he looked yesterday. Uh, you know, it's, it's reasons to be cheerful for for us as Celtic fans. It's just it's just what you want to see. You know, he is an electric player when he's on form, and last season was a difficult season for everyone involved because a manager came in that, that there wasn't scheduled or expected to be a change of manager there was a pursuit of a new manager there was a new style of play all those different types of things but when you see the ball getting moved quickly when you see creative players looking for somebody like, like Kyogo as quickly as possible to give him as much a chance as possible to score you know he'll play he'll play far worse than score goals this season I think with Kyogo he was a uh, he, he was exceptional yesterday. Yeah, I think he'd done everything but score. But his link up play, he, his passing to Kuhn, I thought was exceptional oh. for, for what led to Kuhn's goal. And just everything about him, his, his movement, his work rate, it was all spot on. He's, he's such an important player. And I suppose you've got to ask the question. So he changed, like, like it was maybe Thursday or Friday, changed agent to CAA base, who we know well now because they're Ange's agent and various other high profile players. To my mind, you only change agent if you're A, looking for a new deal, but he's only just signed one of them, or B, you're looking for a move. So who knows what will happen But he amongst others is, is shaping up pretty well Paddy one of the things myself and James discussed On the, the post-match last night was What looks to be a new shape uh, In possession under Brendan Rodgers Particularly against a low block Which we've seen from Kelly yesterday And the back four reverts to a three And Greg Taylor is roving about It's not just inverted fullback He's just scooting about wherever he wants By the looks of it But it's, it's clearly by design At one point I looked up in the second half Scales or something in the back three of the ball, and Taylor was at centre forward. Yeah. He'd found himself in that position. Get your best player in the ball. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that. Scales. And then I heard Rogers talking at the end of the game about we're looking at new ways to to break down the low yeah. block, and we're, we're trying different things and, and transition and otherwise. And it's, I, I say to James, you obviously we've seen some some turgid displays last season, but it was the horseshoe of death and recycling <laughs> possession and all that. It looked very different. Uh, it was, it was uh, it's a breath of fresh air. What a title. Yeah. <laughs> the horseshoe of death. Uh, it's yours now, mate. Um, I think for me, we attempted this at the end of last season um, in a few games where you, you were kind of seeing, it was almost like Taylor was given a bit of a free roll. Um, and it is quite nice to see what he was kind of doing with that yesterday. Um, do we see similar from Alistair Johnson coming down the line? Maybe as well. I think that... That could be an option there too. It definitely works. I thought the first half, a couple of times, it was quite uh, tippy tappy around around the eighteen yard line um, of of Kilmarnock's box, and you know, like we were very very tidy on the ball at points. We were always in control of it, but just a couple of times, you're like, we can't just walk it into the net here. Uh, that we, we can't just pass it into the net. But that that build up play, them familiarising themselves with how this is a a, a new style is only going to get better and and they did look in really good control of possession yesterday at points. I can see it coming off. There was a couple of close ones that nearly got through when they were kind of playing a, a, around the, the D of the box and I, I thought what a goal that would have been if they were able to slip Kyogo through or Hatati or O'Reilly. There were so many options yesterday and definitely that, that extra player coming up is, is going to give any team something to think about. Um, we look quick. We look really, really quick, and I think that yeah, albeit, albeit it's the start of the season, um, I, I'm just excited to see if we do improve upon our, our, our playing squad um, with quality players. Does that tempo go up one more? Because again, what I seen yesterday from that kind of style of play, from throwing bodies forward, was those majestic runs from Kyogo, but no service going through to him again. Yeah, and I think we've, we've nearly had this guy for four years. And we've been crying out for a playmaker to give him the ball that way. And um, he, as we said, he cut a frustrated figure last season. Um, but there seemed to be something different. There was a, there was a, a few different areas where the ball was, was getting through to him. But I just still think we're missing someone with that colour pass. We've spoken about the fact that he'd done everything but score. But you've, you've mentioned or suggested a couple of big chances. There was one in the first half where he, 
He took it on his path, yep. right in the centre of the box. It was a great kind of turn and touch, and he Loved just it. lifted it over the keeper. He made a couple of decent saves, Robbie McCrory, ex Rangers goalie. Um, and that one prevented Kyogo on that occasion to get cleared off the line. And then there was a brilliant move in the second half, free flowing stuff down the left hand side. Hatai plays a, a, just a wicked pacey yep. ball across goal. And actually, he, he should be tucking this one away. It was a great team move, and Kyogo just failed on that occasion. But we are finding him, yeah. and that's what's really encouraging for a coach. You don't need to worry about Kyogo finding his feet in, in front of goal, and another day he gets his hat trick, and, and we might find that in the coming weeks. What about the penalty he never got? Ah, wild. <laughs> wild. Just, where do you start? I, I mean, it's, it, it's crazy. And they're, they're trying to say it's a, a natural coming together. No chance. What about, what about the one McCausland got last year when he's running out the park? <laughs> oh, I just was. never a penalty I, I, and always a penalty. I, it, it's mad. Yeah. In real time, I thought. Um, who is it? Uh, who was was it Don, Don, Don Robertson. Don, Robertson. Don, Don McRobertson. <laughs> uh, Donny Mack was waiting to. I think he was waiting for VAR to make the decision for him. I, I, or I thought that's what was happening. But it's brother Greg. And he's, the just, he's just let the time. No, they just turned around and said no penalty. Yeah. I just thought that was he's a strange he's decision. He's 10 yards away from it as well. Yeah. Like, Do you know what? I, I really hate when you're 3 or 4 0 up or whatever and refs go, ah, we'll just leave that aye. one. Aye. Doesn't matter. Doesn't. Know, the game's a game, the rules are the rules. And, and I thought that was a stonewaller. But very encouraging to see everything that Kyogo's bringing to the party. And I hope he's here for a long time to come. We've done the, the show last night, and obviously it was a live show, so we get various comments coming in. And a user, Celtic Girl, I think was the name, who basically says, Invincible season? Question mark. Oh, very, yeah. very soon to be making such a statement. But what do you think, Paddy, of the fact that we, we've started like a train there, and already nearest rivals are dropping points? Can Celtic... I put a wee fiver on it, aye. Stick a fiver on mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it. Um, Not bad odds. Proper it's invincible. Proper league cups. No, no. The league. Just league. I'm beating in the league. But the, I know it's very early, but it's hard to even at this early stage see anyone coming to Celtic Park and, and taking a draw, let alone a win, don't you think? Oh, listen, it, it, you, just it. this uber confidence. It, it, all you need to do is look at look at an example of a game for last season, such as the Hearts game, where fate or <laughs> something else can conspire against you to make things very difficult for you. Um, it, it can happen. You know, it can happen. Games can turn turn in an instant so I'm, I'm not going to be as bold as to turn around and say I expect that what, what I would say is on, on the very early evidence very early evidence um, we are going to be a very tough nut to crack domestically but and there's always a but the shenanigans that are going on off the park you know those things do affect what happens on the park it affects the mood of the playing squad there, there isn't a playing squad alive in professional football that doesn't like Fresh blood coming into it, so I would I would just be and it's that that's not pessimism from me. No. I think we're well within our rights to question the strategy that's going on off the park, and and believe me that you know for example we could be looking at Matt O'Reilly walking out the door. You could be looking at O'Reilly Tati and Kyogo. That's feasible, right? That and could very easily could happen in the next two weeks. Was. So what's the what's the attitude of the squad then? You know the the free roving Greg Taylor all of a sudden doesn't have those three guys to link with and that fluidity that we've been searching for over the past 12 months and we now see it can very very quickly change so whilst a lot of people would have went there yesterday and went ah everything's fine great 4-0 and brilliant squad looks strong there's a very real chance that some of those players won't be there who's going to replace them do we have them lined up and unfortunately I don't think we do all valid points Smith and we'll get any detail on that just shortly but in terms of match day one, very positive start, very good stuff all round. And, and one other guy that we'll touch on before we close out this section, making his first Celtic start competitively, is Casper Schmeichel. Not a lot for him to do. Took a couple of chances with some of the, the balls at feet here and there. A um, couple of very comfortable saves into the bargain as well. I spoke to him on Thursday at the press conference at Celtic Park. Very decent guy and a very focused guy. And the challenge for him, there was talk that he's really keen to be part of Denmark's World Cup squad in two years' time, and that's the real focus. So he's not just here to pick up the pennies, James. He looks like he's keen for the challenge of being a Celtic player. Yeah, it's funny. You know, he, he speaks and acts like a much younger man. This is a guy at the kind of... You know, so does Maff been on a good way. <laughs> the back, <laughs> the back end of his career. A very storied and experienced career. But he just he strikes you as someone that's just very, very keen to play as much football as he can, as much as his heart was as well. But... Hart had had the dip and come back to us. This is different. You know, Kasper Schmeichel was in the Denmark's Worth Euros, playing in, in Belgium at a decent level, and he's looking to continue that and go into the Champions League as well. So I think it's great, you know. But, I mean, his performance yesterday, I would say, you know, he 
could be Casper the ghost and goals. It wouldn't have made any difference. Oh, you know? he went there. I, I he knew went there. Knew was coming. He, he went there. He's gone early. <laughs> uh, Paddy, as, as our uh, goalie representative on the panel, what's your thoughts on, on how that position is now shaping up with him and Sinasalo? Yeah, as I said when he signed, I think it's uh, I do think it's a good signing in terms of the experience that he brings. I just think that we're lazy in our scouting. That's uh, another story, which I'm sure we're going to in section two. Um, no, we can, section two, James. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, for me, I think he's he's very professional. I think he's he, he plays at a, he's, he's played at a very high level throughout his career, and and I think you know, I just think he wants to enjoy his final years. I think that's the the, the, the kind of idea of it. He had such a, a good spell with with Leicester and. Um, played in some good good teams with them and then getting the experience over in France and then going to Belgium. I think he's just quite happy to like test the waters elsewhere um, while still playing a full season for those clubs as well. And I think for us, um, domestically, absolutely, I think he'll be fine. Uh, Europe's a test for any any team, um, any player. And we, we've seen it with Joe Hart. I, I go back to the, the Leipzig game and the mistake it was made there. Um, I think that you know that test will come for Casper Schmeichel. It's how uh, how ready is he? Um, yesterday is a, a telltale sign for Celtic goalkeepers that you, you're not going to have a lot to do domestically. Not always, but you need to be switched on mm -hmm. for ninety minutes. Do I think he's got that? Absolutely, I do. He was asked about all these things during the press conference, and you know how do you stay focused and concentrate and, and all that kind of idea. He was also asked about the reverse of yesterday, i.e., when you're playing as a Celtic keeper in a Champions League, how do you approach those kind of games? as a team and as a goalie individually. And he says, we want a league doing it at Leicester. Sometimes you need to prepare to sit in, soak up the pressure and do your thing on the break. So he's experienced a lot in football and I think he'll bring that to the dressing room. I just think he's a guy who, he's still hungry to do more in football and he's not just here to you know, tick off a box myth and, and follow the Joe Hartwood. I, I love how when you meet these guys, it sounds like you've went to school with them. And that. <laughs> so, so I, was, I was talking to him yesterday and he was just saying, his eyes reminds me of the Leicester season. And that. <laughs> um, to me, to me, it's the perfect replacement. I, 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 he's just a keeper I've always admired. Um, I always remember when, when you mentioned about Joe Hart and Leipzig. I always remember Joe Hart's uh, interview after that, and he's like, "This is how the manager wants us to play." Now I'm like, "No, mate, just don't mistake. pass it to their striker." Aye, aye. That's the wee tweak you probably just need to make, Joe. If that's all right, cheers, mate. <laughs> um, I just think we've got somebody who's really confident, which you need to be because you're got to be out of the game for long periods of time so you need that self-confidence and that uh, concentration real experienced keeper played in top leagues as Paddy says different leagues top leagues won things so you know ticks that particular box I, it, it, for me it's just the, the perfect marriage at the, the right time as for Europe I don't really have many concerns about me in Europe for, for the reasons we've already stated um, and we've actually got somebody in to, to future proof us as well so uh, that's, the, that's the one bit we have got right uh, I'm actually excited uh, to see Schmeichel because it, some of the saves he was pulling off in pre-season were, were unreal mm -hmm. Real, uh, like James mentioned you, you would think he was, he was much younger than what he actually is so no I, I think I think we've, we've definitely um, we've definitely pulled something off there where dare I say this I know we had a bit of Joe Hart loving um, as, as he was exiting the building but I think we've got a better keeper in than what we had I think we've got a better nice. shop stopper and a guy who's better with the ball at his feet. And as I was saying to him the other day, Miff, you're just a, a good, good friend. <laughs> I mean, Casper, and ah. welcome to the club. Uh, as always, we cover the game, as I mentioned, in our final whistle show, and that's available right now. You'll find all the links to that at theCelticExchange.com. If you want to get even closer to the Celtic Exchange in the new season, then you can do so in a few different ways. Number one, you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Celtic 321. Whatever every Tuesday, we'll send you three articles, two videos, and one quote from the week in Celtic. Number two, if you want to receive breaking news from us and from Celtic, you can sign up to the Celtic Exchange WhatsApp channel. And number three, if you want to support the channel throughout the season and to enjoy benefits such as ad-free listening, you can do so at the theCelticExchange.Supercast.com. You'll find the links for all of this in the show notes. And with your help, we can then bring you even more podcasts, more reaction and more Celtic in the new season. On that note, let's take a very short break. We'll be back with you soon. Welcome back folks, a lot of the noise we're hearing just now regarding the lack of summer signings is that Peter Lowell, the non-exec chairman of Celtic, is somehow to blame for all of that. 
I don't buy into the theory personally, uh-huh. but I do Can want to hear what you guys man. think, as well as the listeners at home. <laughs> at home, let us know on Twitter at Celtic Exchange or in the YouTube comments if you're watching there. Or you can contact me directly on Tino at the Celtic Exchange.com. But Miff, what do you think of the suggestion? Is Peter Lowell the reason why Celtic aren't making signings? Absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt about it. All the evidence points to it. Really? Um, I, I, I honestly do. I can't think. Oh, either that or we're, we're planning to, or Desmond's planning to sell it. So I, I can't. You why buy, why buy, would you need to fatten this theories? particular calf any further? I don't. I, 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 why would uh, we stop? But it, it's negligent to stop pull that amount of cash. It I just. Is. I, I don't. I don't. You, I don't get it. You don't think Celtic will do anything the next three weeks? I think they'll do something. I don't think they'll do. But I mean, it was. I know I've mentioned it before, but this time last year we had less money than what we have now, and you were expecting us to break our summer transfer tariffs. We now have more money. And just don't really seem to be doing anything. I mean, the, the links have even been very, very poor. We've done, the, we've done the changing rooms up. Well, they look lovely. Mm. They do they look fantastic. World class basics. World class basics. Awful. But I would like a world class transfer policy, Aye. which would probably be included, ironically, within world class basics for a Aye. football team, have a decent transfer structure. Um, for me, you know, we, we all give a lot of money to the club. We're well within our rights to moan about this and I know it might seem like a moan but the danger is that it's going to out, it's going to overshadow what you're seeing on the park that's my problem is that that games came yesterday and you're like right great brilliant three points right what's happening lads and you've we've come in here today <laughs> nothing happened other than potential outgoings and it's a bit like right lads you know come on now six how many Champions League games did we get eight. Eight, eight Champions League games if there's no Major incomings, never mind the outgoings, are going to be lambs to the slaughter again. Do, do we any want that? Uh, of course not, but why do you think, and, and many others do, why do you think Peter Lowell specifically is the man to blame? Look at the timelines around when he wasn't involved in the club and when he was, and look at what happened in the transfer window and how signings were procured. It's very obvious, I think. I, I mean, I mean I've, I've, I've brought my Colombo Mac with me, I could, you know, stick it on. Light up a cigar and start start giving you my reasons why it's, it's but, fairly. Uh, there is just one more thing. Uh, j- just one more question. But it it, it it it's got his fingerprints all over it. it. The only thing I think is different. The the volume of players that were brought in is is less, and I think that's down to Rogers saying no nah, no. Nah. Um, I think. The the transfers make sense, but uh, did Schmeichel? Well, you tell me, you know your mate Casper. Cass. Did he at uh, Cassi the big K? Did Tino come out and say Rogers basically text him? Yeah. I asked him the question. So in the press conference, got a few questions and I says, can you tell us when Celtic and Rogers first showed interest in you? And he said, I think it was three or four days after we got knocked out by Germany in the Euros. That is, you can look at that in a couple of ways. It certainly doesn't give... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. doesn't give bad log on things. Oh my God. You'd like... I mean... I want to know what ways Tino's want to look at it. That's, he could look at it in a few ways. Here's one of the ways. <laughs> one of the ways is that Surely they were maybe assessing and looking at other goalies up until that point. Look at Paddy's eyes, man. 20 weeks. But, right, well, see, that's, see, that's pish no, about 20 weeks. No. Oh, you, you can't sign oh. a goalie in February, right? So no, you, but you can, can, you can, you line can up. start. Ah, right. Exactly. But Come you on. can potentially look at other options and they may not have been the right options and then when Casper Schmeichel becomes available, you go for it. See, the thing is, Celtic have landed in a brilliant option here and a brilliant backup uh, but, and it's still a problem. But, can but, can I ask you a question? 100%, question? but the problem is on that, you know, is that where is the due diligence? There's none. We got lucky. There's can, none. But can, maybe they've been doing that due diligence on other options. Mm. Can, 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 I a, a can I ask a question now, just on that? Because it feels like the three years are ganging up Tino here, which, which I'm really enjoying. So, <laughs> is the school of thought then that the work towards Sinasol has been done in, independently of, of Schmeichel? That was already kind of done and dusted and we had done our scouting, our due diligence and we were happy enough for him to be number one, potentially? Mm. Mm. Or no. are we going with the Baniac saying learn off him? <laughs> <laughs> you you learn off the Baniac, we'll see where it gets you, son. <laughs> there you go. And, and then we just happened to, you know. Do you know what the Rog the, the, Rog was sitting at the villa with a glass of wine after watching the Euros and went, I've said Casper a wee text. There's no way I know, right? But what you've got right now, I just think it's interesting. It depends how you look at things, how you look at life, right? How you look at You've got a really decent number one and a really decent backup. Agreed. And people are now still wanting to pick holes on it. Can you not just accept no, but, some no, things but it, are good? No, but it affects everything else though because surely, surely if that's done properly, then other business is done properly. And it's the fact that we don't have the structure in place 
I know some people yep. have gave up their season tickets as a result of it. Yep. We don't have that structure in place where these things... Look, now, we are actually locking out on things rather than formally identify them at an early stage and going and getting the business done. Surely, surely if we had something proper in place, the first two things we'd have done after the Scottish Cup final would have been Aidan Bernardo being signed. And then that would have left all that debate out, out the window. Because if you come in at the start of the season, those two had been signed, the two Coopers had been signed, you'd have maybe had that more of a grace period to say, right, well, there's still another couple of weeks to go, might be some incomings and outgoings, blah, blah, blah. But there's, there's not even been that. I mean, Bernardo only gets signed on Friday. Mm. It's mad. I think Celtic changed their tact on the negotiating. I think they'd agreed a price for Bernardo and they went back and renegotiated that. And ultimately, they've eventually got a result. But you could that, that was a risk. You could have lost Bernardo. And if the manager wants him, you need to go and pay what you need to go and pay. The suggestion with Ida is that Norwich are playing ridiculous numbers to the point where they're asking for 10 plus. Celtic shouldn't pay that. Well, they're right on, not to pay that. Move on then. Yeah. But I agree. I agree with that. So you need to have a plan B and a plan C and stuff like that. So I'm not sure they've addressed that one correctly. But I do think they've absolutely nailed the goalie position. And it's funny, we live in Celtic world for can't do right for doing wrong. And like, so just a second, Paddy, because no we're, no we're, we're going to debate and criticise the board at different times. Yes, absolutely today and in the weeks ahead and, you know, it's what we'll do we'll continue to ask challenging questions but I also think there's a real reluctance at any point to give credit for this I just think there's a good piece of work done there with the goalies but you've said it yourself already it, it wasn't Celtic it done that it was Brendan Rodgers it got Casper Smeichel Lotino yes albeit there's negotiations for a contract absolutely the fact that and I, I go back to that 20 week comment it, it is lazy it is lazy and it comes from not having a structure in place because we don't have a scouting network that's working at and, the moment. And we don't have a head of recruitment. And we don't have a head of recruitment. And I could go down a whole different route in terms of how we're putting this money into the into the club at the moment. There's no transparency between the, um, the board and the fans. You know, you're, you're seeing that th those signings, as I've said, I said three weeks ago on this show, it is lazy. It is lazy. It's continuing to be lazy. Casper Smeichel's a very good goalkeeper, absolutely. But a manager's friendship has brought him in. A manager's friendship with someone brought Adam Ida in, which saved a season last year. That's twice that's happened. The club should be delivering that for the manager, yeah. not the manager delivering for the club on that side. Can you just imagine Roger swaggering about after he have text Casper? I just get back to me, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine him? So how long is he going to swagger but that's do you know it's a, it's a very um, decent point Paddy but I suppose the manager is part of the recruitment setup, and if you happen to have a manager with good contacts and connections and the I same know, as Ange as well I do agree with that and, and you want it to be people the manager wants in ultimately surely I think Rodgers has, has had the rough side of it in that in his career so far where he's been subject to like, transfer committees not been backed mm -hmm. you know all, all these types of things it's the reason he left the first um, time but uh, yeah, you know, with us, with Leicester and, and, and with Liverpool. But surely it gets to a point where a modern football club has a department that deals with most of these things, tracks players, identifies players, brings players to the manager that they would then go and watch or send a scout to watch, whatever it would be. To me, it doesn't really seem like that, that much of an ask to have something in place that we all know is in place and whose responsibilities it is I, I, I don't think we're asking for something no. that's completely I, out I, of order here I, I agree I don't think you know I think at the moment Celtic's structure in terms of scouting and recruitment isn't quite right it's not where it should be it's in, it's in a state of flux at the moment you know after Mark Lowell's exit but I just think any club if you've got a manager who can influence that and say well listen I'm close to Casper Smeichel there's a guy I trust I think if we can get him we should speak to him that will always be all right. It doesn't matter if your structure's great and perfect. Yeah. You should always encourage that. Of course I, you should. I think that's part of the mix. But what we are seeing is that's pretty much it. Aye. I, I get you know that what I mean? Well. That Aye. is a problem. It should be Rogers going, right, as we sit down with the recruitment team in March or April, by the way, a couple of guys I know from my career, well worth a chat. I can have a warm you know, chat in their ear mm -hmm. and then I'll put my touch for you to work out a deal or whatever if they're, if they're open to coming. And then he steps back. It shouldn't be... Rogers essentially doing a deal like Barry Fry. Do you know what I mean? It's that those days are gone, and they should be. He's a guy who likes. He's a guy who likes to coach. He's not a guy that should be involved in this stuff, distracting him from what his yeah. job actually is. Well, a, a good case study would be January, right? So you mentioned either. Mm -hmm. So how was Kuhn scouted, and you know how did that come about? So 
was he somebody that was already on Rogers radar for before? Because he'd made a couple of big money moves and hadn't worked out for him. Mm. So it might have been somebody Rogers was interested in previously. No, I, I, I think he did come through. I think he did come through Matt Law, but he was the only one that Rogers said that's yes, that, that's a that, That's what I mean. So so what's the you know certain amount of money, certain age, you know, resale value. He, he did it fit that be. profile, but he was just better than the others. But and, and what we're seeing now is bearing fruit. So yeah. if you're if you're a bit more selective in that area of your recruitment, it can bring you players that are first team ready. You know, interesting to see uh, Odin Tiago home getting getting some minutes yesterday as well. You mm-hmm. know, guys who I, I like the fact Rogers called them out mm-hmm. and said, "Well, yeah, you've got talent, but sure, sure, I, I, I want to see it." He's in the squad. He's got some minutes, so that would suggest that maybe maybe we've got to see a bit more of him this year. Fantastic. So you can get the quality out there, but for me, surely you need the correct structure in place to go and spend the bigger money. It's even more mm. important. That it's more crucial that you get a return on your investment. It's far more dangerous. Putting, ah, yeah, it, it's fraught with danger, as mm. we know, for only four, five years ago when Aye. we did actually spend big. So even more of a reason not to repeat that and have the structure in place. I just I just don't understand it. I, I, don't, I just don't get it at all. Yeah, I mean, just, just to make sure we... Can I cover all the bases within this section? I've asked Muff the question at the top, you know, do you think Peter Lovell specifically is, is causing a blockage and he's part of the problem? Go on. And, and I think ultimately it's, my only conclusion can be he doesn't want that structure in place because he wants to have a say in Celtic spending money. That's agreed. But it's, but it's not his job to say. Yeah. So the, to my point, I'll come to you first, James, and then Paddy for his thoughts. Michael Nicholson's the CEO. He works very closely with Chris Mackay, the CFO. They work hand in hand. Uh, you know, on transfers amongst other things, that's a huge responsibility to Celtic. I don't for a minute think that those two individuals who have spent a number of years working with Peter Lovell are going to allow the non-exec chairman to come in and operate them from behind. I just don't think that's the way it goes. If that is the case, if Peter Law is executive at Celtic, and I don't believe he is, then those two guys, Michael Nicholson and Chris McKay, should tender their resignations tomorrow morning because if you're a CEO and someone is has overreach on you, then you're not in control and when things go wrong they fall on your head so they should be going tomorrow so I just don't think it's the case what I do think is the case is that Peter Law came in what 2003 after Alan McDonald October um, 2003 2003 so Alan McDonald done a good job got Henrik signed up but was given the money out and Celtic were you know in a poor financial statement law took over and in comes austerity and striking and all that stuff and that's been the way Celtic have been run the last 21 years with Peter Law's austerity in mind as an accountant and that culture stalks Celtic every single department it's it's austerity everywhere can we do this cheaper can we do it for a bit less can we get a bit more the Bernard, Bernardo signing yeah what did we save in the end like a million and a half two million something like that give or take right great you know it's, it's always nice to get a deal I like a deal but the risk they took on that was not getting Bernardo because there's every other team in the world available to him you know not every team but there's plenty of other teams yeah. available to him and if he'd gone there, we've got another problem to fill. And we're not even filling the ones that we've already got without creating new ones. So to save a million and a half and risk that, I thought it was very, very reckless. And yeah. that, But that's because it's in their culture to do that. Mm. And it's even more galling when you've got 80, 90, maybe even 100 million sitting, so you're trying to save exactly. one, one and a half. Paddy, as I mentioned there, Michael Nicholson, top of the tree, Chris Mackay, closely beside him. Peter Lowell, somewhere over here, non-exec chairman. But do you believe he is influencing what's going on? I think I think there must be a bit of it. I wouldn't just say it's entirely Peter Lovell, but he, rewind four years, our manager was the one that brought the, the players in in that window, was given the money to do so. There had to be a bit of a rebuild. We spoke about the structure. That needed to be rebuilt too. We thought Don Mackay, a very, very promising interview with him at the beginning of the season, setting out what he wanted to do at Celtic was, was, uh, was promising, but it wasn't allowed to happen. Why? Because the same people are still at that club today, mm. and that's a big, big issue for me. There's no changing. There's no. There's no difference of opinion. Michael uh, Michael Nicholson has been put into that post because they needed to fill the, the the gap at that point. And I take nothing away from Michael Nicholson. I, I I I don't I don't know enough about him, so I can't really can't really comment on him. What I do know though is what Peter Lawwell is about, and it's exactly what James has mentioned. He has pulled everything in his reign Celtic and as a club especially when we went up against the last, um, obviously the 10 years with without a, a, a Rangers team uh, really challenging us. They pulled the money in then. You've seen the t- calibre of player that we were bringing in. You've seen what Neil Lennon was given. Why he left? Because he wasn't getting any more money. 
we seen what Ronald Dyla was up against, and then the minute they came back, Desmond was the ones that uh, was the one that went and got Brendan Rodgers. So for me, that culture is still there, and we've put ourselves, we've shot ourselves in the foot again because we're now in a position where a lot of people are saying just sign players. We have got so many players still in that squad that we can't get rid of. We've got four centre halves that we are not going to get a game with us that no one's taking a punt on as well. Um, the the squad is still bloated, and they will not they will not sign players until they get players out. Mm. I, I think it's a very decent point to suggest that it's a it's a culture thing at Celtic. It's a long running thing. You know, it's a it's almost become a habit at Celtic to operate in such a way rather than. Peter Lowell specifically saying, don't do this, lowball this, do that. I, I don't think he's having any sort of day-to-day hand in dealings, but I can understand how his his ways historically might still be practised by by certain people at the club. There's an interesting fact that we talked about the ceremony yesterday, you know, Flag Day, you know, the parade, Jim Craig and all that kind of stuff. Peter Lowell wasn't there, and the club chairman is always in attendance there, whether it's Ian Bank here or... Brian Quinn or other figures in the past and for whatever reason Peter Lowell has saw fit not to, to be part of that ceremony he was at the game there's some pictures of him outside the ground before it and it's, a, it's an interesting one for me Paddy for whatever reason he's chosen not to do so perhaps because he knows it causes concern and raises tension in the stands but does that maybe lead you to think that at some point Peter Lowell himself might say I've gone as far as I can at Celtic and to allow Michael Nicholson as an individual to move forward and perhaps the club to move forward, I should maybe stand back from proceedings. What do you think of that? I, I can see the idea of it, but I think that it, this is something that's ingrained in him and he's, he's been here for so long. And yes, there has been success. No one is denying that. It's the opportunity to to in, in, increase that success. It's the opportunity to improve, seize that opportunity that, that we have not done year after year. Um, from 2013 onwards when we, we had opportunities to qualify for the Champions League. Was the squad ready? No. Did we qualify? No. So we always ended up in the Europa League. Mm. We're now in a position where the last three seasons we've not had to play any qualifiers. Have we done anything about it? Have we had the squad ready for it? No. Again. So there's that point where he has to say, I've taken the club as far as as I can. I've, I've been involved in so much. But there's also there's a lot of shortcomings for Peter Lowell. And and as fans, we 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 are we have a right to address that. We hundred percent have a right to to be angry. Yeah, Matthew mentioned you know Peter Lowell's prints are, are all over the current strategy. That I think that was a term you used or similar. And you've got many examples from the past. You know the the Willow Flood signing, not signing John McGinn, not signing Stephen Fletcher. You know to, to try and save pennies. You know to try and really lowball offers. You mentioned Ronnie Dyla. I think Ronnie Dyla was brought in on the cheap. He was potentially going to come in as Keane's number, number two. two to Roy Keane or whatever. We end up just made him number one. You know, things like that. Um, they just felt like cheap moves at the time. Do you think Celtic will be unable to move forward or as a fan base, as a collective, will be unable to move forward so long as Peter Lowell's still around? Not necessarily. I just think you need to see impactful change in, in the way that we're structured. And it has to be transparent. Has to we, the club has to show the fans what they're doing and why they're doing it with, with hopefully an end goal in sight. Now, I get the end goal might be tricky because no board wants to set themselves up for a fall, but the whole Lobel thing is a, you know, it, it's it's not all bad. What he's done for the club, he's presided over a tremendously successful period, at least domestically. Um, th- we we know how things can go if you don't run a club well it can get very very messy um, and in some cases you can cease to exist so you need to be really careful about what you wish for but by the same token I think the reason why Celtic are where they are is because the fans don't really take a day off and question how the clubs run and neither should we it's something we care about deeply it's something we invest a lot in both financially and emotionally so when it comes to things of this nature, where, you know, what's the best thing about pre-season is getting to see new players. Fans have packed in there, put on that display yesterday. There's not one new outfield player on that pitch. It's, you know, I, I just I just think we're, we're well within our rights to question what's going on behind the scenes. For me, I think the, the shadow that Lowell casts over the operations of, of the club not not so much on the pitch from the, the playing squad around how Rogers manages that and who he selects, absolutely not. But behind it, how the club's structured, 
um, how they source players, how they negotiate for that. I mean, the Bernardo thing. Do you think that would have just been Nicholson that decided all of a sudden they wanted to save a million and a half pound? I think he did, but he did because he learned that's how you do deals. So well, here's one question to round things off then. Right now, Celtic haven't signed any outfield players for the new season out with the re-signing of Bernardo. And Pierre Lovell's getting in the neck. You know, certainly from what you see online and catching messages. It's not just stuff. Lovell for no. me, by the way. Just, no. to, just to state that, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm answering the question directly, but it doesn't just lie at Lovell's door. Certainly somebody's got to have the cojones to challenge so for a lot of folk it does like Lobel's door and that, that's why I've you know, raised the, the, the question in, in this section of the show lots of folk are just Lobel this Lobel that paw prints all over it that, that's the that's the lie of the land what if Celtic signed two or three crackers between now and the end of the window is anybody going to come out and say Lobel's done a, a real job there well done, Pedro. it just doesn't happen so I think there's a bit of the bogeyman stuff going on and Celtic fans as a collective generally speaking are quite angry just now and think we're all frustrated and I think you need someone to point that at I think Peter Lovell's just a lightning rod but for it. The point is, do you know, it should have already happened. So even if they do do it before the end of the season, they should have already done it. So you're not going to turn around and go, say, oh, well done, guys, for doing something you should have already done. Surely. I, I don't necessarily think, as long as you get the right players in by the end of the window, I think that's the right way to do it. I disagree. I disagree. I, I, I just, disagree. Just so, solely on the, the, the basis, I'm, I'm talking about it time and time again. We've went into group stage games. Cold. And we've, got, we've got found out straight away. Teams haven't gelled. Some players, some new players are on the bench. But the group you know? stage doesn't start for the 17th of September. That's only so two weeks after, after the window. But, I know, but if you get the right players in the next fortnight, but, surely that's good enough. But we won't t- spend the money for the right players. Look, look at the difference. Look, look at the difference. Way, look at the difference with Hatati and Kuhn with pre-season behind them. Oh, I know. Well, listen, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing guys. These guys, so these guys won't have had that with the team. They should have been on the point in America. I'm, it's go- just- I'm going to get back to the example I gave. Carter Vickers, Jaw and Jack Amakis were all signed on the last day of a window and all phenomenally successful at Celtic. But we were, we the- were in a rebuild then. Uh- we, 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 we didn't have you know, we didn't have the stacks of cash that we've already got and we had a new manager coming in trying to make an impression. Like I, I, I get I get your your kind of being contrary here, but I don't really care about anything <laughs> in terms of counter argument other than I am absolutely steadfast in my belief that we should have done business by now and okay. I don't think there is any excuse for it I'd quickly say on the point of the guys signing in the final day of the window absolutely brilliant signings of course because they had a great domestic season Europe we were alright we had a lot we had a lot of change that season you mm-hmm. look at the teams yeah. against Betis you look at the team um, against even obviously what we put out in the last game uh, mixed with youth because we were still nowhere near the, the level required we signed three players in December that came in in the January and they were given time. They were given plenty of time with the team. Again, still finding their feet though. Mm-hmm. Still finding their feet. Not everyone's going to hit the ground running. And I think that that's the big, that's the missing bit for Celtic. It always has been. And it doesn't have to be. And it doesn't have to be. That's that's the biggest bugbear I've got with the club. I get that and I think it's always preferred to get these guys in. Like the question is, Benfica potentially don't let Jota go until the last days of the window. Spurs potentially don't let a Carter Vickers go to the last days of the window. And wherever Jack and Marcus was, sometimes those deals aren't available in January and early August. But sorry, if, July and early August. But if they're scouted and they're quality players, then the one thing that'll make them go is if you pay the money. And that's uh, that, that, that's the end of the day. Money talks. It's not if they you pay top dollar, you probably it's do not get they won't let them go. They won't let them go for what you offered. Mm, okay, we'll need to move on. I follow, <laughs> for a follow up Sunday. Uh, just a couple of wee bits, <laughs> a couple of wee bits on Brendan Rodgers before we close out the section. Generally speaking, he seems quite relaxed about it. He's you know he's spoken several times now to the media. You know before and after the game there against Kilmarnock, and he seems to be fairly focused on his job on the park at least for this moment in time. But he did speak out a wee bit before Kelly, and I'll, I'll give you the quotes here. He says, I'm not going to get bogged down in the negative and toxic energy myth that comes around transfers. He name checked you. We'll work with the players we have. We know we'll make them better. We know as a club what we need to do and what what we need to improve. And we've got just under four weeks to be able to do that. What do you think, Muff, about his general approach? Regardless of what's going on, I think he actually seems in, in as good a place as we've seen him in either spell itself. He is a, he is a kind of politician the way he goes about things. He's kind of delightfully made it sound there like he's on board with the board whilst also telling them to get their finger out you know that but that's the he's, nature he's cute that's, that's the nature that's of what, what he is. does you know yes. just grab that Gucci belt pull it up and tell them how it is <laughs> you know get the chest out so I, 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 it's, it, it's a Rogers quote or should I say it's a Brendan quote uh, that's a Brendan quote so that's yeah. a Brendan quote Paddy what do you think he does seem in a good place he does but we've got four weekends of 
the same questions coming to him. Um, and if there's no change, then, I mean, that's that's worrying. We said it, said it last year, if nothing changes, nothing changes. All right, let's move on. We'll take another <laughs> short break. When we come back, we'll bring you a new feature for the new season. Welcome back, folks. As mentioned there before the break, we've got a new feature for the new season. I was getting fed up getting beat off Miff, Paddy and James with the various other things, so we've got a new one for the new campaign. It's called Name the Goal Scorer. Rules very simple. Mm. We'll play a clip from a notable Celtic goal in recent times. All you have to do is name the goal scorer, whose name will be bleeped out from the commentary. All very clear. Recent times been the early 70s, aren't they? Very uh, recent. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I just think this is just another attempt to <laughs> try Jeremy and there we go. You know, just, uh, we'll play a clip. Is it in English? It is in English. Right, good, that's a start. <laughs> the best way to do it is let's just do it. Let's play the clip. Jens looks early for Hakshabanovic. Taylor's already ahead of him. It's Hakshabanovic. Shabana! Away you go. Uh, no, no, so no, 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 but hold on before anyone goes. What are you saying? No, th- there's a very telling. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's a couple of telling things. You were asking if it's recent. If Jens is playing and Hans yeah. is playing, it's pretty recent. What's the big giveaway for you? The celebratory music. Yeah, so it says it's Champions League. So the game in, its, in itself is Celtic v Shakhtar. Uh, Champions League match day five, Celtic Park, 25th of October 2022. But I think the penny dropped for Paddy first. Paddy, who was it? <laughs> Correct. So we'll get it beeped out. As a format, is it okay for you? No, I don't know it was, it it was Jack, it was 99 Red Bones that was playing yeah. in the background. Is that his part of the tune as uh, well? Uh, so that's a second giveaway as well. But we'll make it harder as the weeks go on. I just wanted to give you a... Oh, I like that, I like that. Like that. Uh, like okay. like he that. doesn't like it anymore. I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm scrapping it and we're going for something new. <laughs> Although, the, the, I, I wouldn't have heard that commentary because well, I was it. at the game. Uh, I watch the highlights when you go home. So... Mm. Not, or if I did I'm eating my kebab so I can't hear it <laughs> ok uh, so we'll run with that next week so it's the uh, name the goal scorer feature and we'll be about the answer for this one and reveal the answer in next week's show and we'll also share the clips on socials for anyone who wants to have a go there however it is 1-0 to us uh, I thought that was a kind of test one but ok 1-0 one, one for the new campaign to close out the show I want to look at Celtic's midfield Celtic's midfield is a hot topic right now with the ongoing talk about Matt O'Reilly latest just this afternoon is that he's in talks with Brighton not him Celtic Celtic are in talks and that seems to be that's from Sky Sports that seems to be relatively advanced Chris Sutton's already tweeted saying with every respect to Brighton he'd like to think O'Reilly's ambitions are higher than that I mean he could stay and play Champions League with us and then move on in January rather than a move to Brighton so who knows how that'll go he's also linked with Chelsea because is it Gallagher? Gallagher, Gallagher's Gallagher's got got he's going to left him so many midfielders already but leave us alone so there's all that going on we also know we've secured Paolo Bernardo he's coming in a five year deal but the question is do you think anyone else in the current squad can do a job this season Miff you mentioned Odin Thiago home uh, Brendan Rodgers was quite pointed in his comments about him and Boson Lawal there's obviously Tomoki Awata who was on the bench uh, on Sunday Paddy then these guys have a serious future in Celtic's first 11 not just squad players I, I just don't know about home. I've not seen enough of them, to be honest. A um, couple of glimpses yesterday, I thought, looked quite tidy. Um, he looks really slight for a, for a centre mid. I, I, quite uh, quite scrawny, sorry, Odin. Um, but I think for me... There's, he, no, there's no way he listens to us, don't worry. Well, he does. <laughs> does he? He does. <laughs> him and, him and Kaz. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think Kaz. that he... Uh, he's still got a bit to prove and I think that there is a player there. I, our managers, you know came out and say that I think I, I trust his judgement on it but it's the want does he want to be here does he want to really push himself and go to that next level I do think that he can um, but I've just I've just got to I, I'm, the jury's out for him I think at the moment there's something about his attitude last season which as, as a moment I quite liked is when the players were walking around that on trophy day mm-hmm. celebrating and he very much removed himself from it not as a bad teammate just no. as a he didn't feel he'd earned his part and I think he's quite right you know you get guys cutting about with the the full kit and the shinies on and they've not kicked the ball all season. Who's a wee boy, Ibrahim, remember? Ah, Rabbi Ibrahim. Did it kill him, man? He, he was gone absolutely right. <laughs> he like played twice. Front, front and centre and all the pictures. Yeah. So I quite like the fact that he's saying, I've not earned this title, this isn't my title and perhaps he'll come back and, and you know put more into it and, and make more of a contribution this season. It's, and the fact that the managers feature him on match day one when you've got O'Reilly and Hattati and McGregor and Paolo Bernardo available but he gets game time. I think it identifies that the manager has seen something in him and thought, okay, over to you. Let, let's see what you've got. 
I, I do. I think the the thing for home is that he's probably hoping for that O'Reilly move. Um, in terms of probably getting more playing time because I do think the the jersey goes to Bernardo, but I still think that we. St- oh. I do. I do. Oh no! I still and think I, that- I like Bernardo, but it's a, that's not a fit. What, is it, where, where, where does Bernardo th- play then? I think but I think Bernardo's going to necessarily start. I think it's going to be Rio, and as it is just now, Rio and O'Reilly and whoever replaces O'Reilly if O'Reilly goes. I don't think O'Reilly and Bernardo are the same player. I think they're really different. So it's a lot to invest in a guy just for your squad. I think what you could easily do, personally, is move Hitati into O'Reilly's position and bring Bernardo into Hitati's position. He's just not necessarily as mobile. Like, that's no day at Celtic is as good as O'Reilly just now, no. so there's no question in that. But Bernardo played 33 times last season, so he, he did feature heavily, albeit not very often as a starter. 11, 11 starts. 11 starts. 11 starts. I, still, appearances. I still think that they will look for another midfielder if Bernardo goes, I do. But I think that... O'Reilly goes. Oh, sorry, O'Reilly goes. I think home... Um, Pierre Lowell's got to sell him Bernardo already, hasn't he? <laughs> is that, is that what you're saying? Would you be surprised? For four million. Uh-huh. Go on for three and a half. <laughs> half a million in the bank. <laughs> See you later. Tomoki Iwata, any future? No. Oh, aye. I think so. No. You used to can just have your own lead. I don't, I, I don't see him taking McGregor's jersey, obviously. And we do need to, obviously, is look, he, look at that for the future. Is he an improvement for Europe? I, th- I think he's got development to go, but I think he's the, the sub for he's McGregor. He's also like 26, 27. 27. Is he as old as that now? Aye. I mean, mm. shit hot when he's 30. Very good player. I do I do think he's a good player, but there's there's levels. Levels. And mm. I just think he's, he would be fine domestically for a season, in my opinion, but we're, we're, we're crying out for this quality that our manager keeps crying out for. And we, we can't, I think too many Celtic fans, including myself, we get sentimental with players and think, I give him a chance. Absolutely. But, We'll, Paddy, we'll, we'll just get done still in three and a half weeks left. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, Muff, is this the season for the Quan? <laughs> what the hell, man? Unleash the Quan. Oh, <laughs> the K Meister. See what I mean by the size of the squad. <laughs> nah, there's, a, there's a lot of bodies around. Yeah, my God, Kobe Ashi's still around and Lagerbiel. Because another lad, Muff, you mentioned them, um, and there's been high hopes from him and a lot of talk over the summer as Boson Laval, but very quickly there when it comes to serious match day, match day one. But, He's nowhere to be seen. No, and that that's that's the challenge for him. Um with the time remaining in the window, is he got to stay in fight or is he got to maybe get another loan out somewhere? Um, or a move, <clears throat> there's talk of a move. Is there talk of a move? Goal. So yeah. I'd like know. to see him you know, at least see if we can see something in him, but he might go score. Yeah, you know, and he seems to be ticking a lot of boxes for the type of midfielder that we we need or, or somebody you could even potentially look at replacing. McGregor it gives a wee bit of extra power in there in the, the, time I mean there's got to be a succession plan yeah, for yeah, yeah. Callum McGregor hasn't there so but listen I, I think we just need to wait and see what happens we're, we're hoping against hope as we've been saying for some time that there's action going on in the background and all of a sudden we're going to get a glut of signings and the places where we need it but <clears throat> excuse me to, to start the season without the signing of a, a centre half a left back and a, another striker is just absolutely criminal yep yep yeah. But we're talking about midfielders just but, now, so... But, hail, hail. Hail, bro. Keep your faith, faith, bro. Uh, I can't wait for the I told you so episode in a few weeks' time, but we'll get to that. Uh, just one final question. Are you ITK? <laughs> I, I, I'm not ITK. One final <laughs> question for this section as we start to head towards the end of the show. If you guys could sign one, just one... Oh, I hate this one. ...of either a top-quality <laughs> creative midfielder, an attacking player, like an O'Reilly, or a defensive one... Don't take part if you don't want to. Or a, or a defensive one, what would you prefer? Centre half, left left sided centre half. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm talking about midfielders. <laughs> I'm talking. Ta- ta- Staying in the midfield. No. <laughs> Creative midfielder, defensive midfielder. I have somebody to play with me here. I'll, I'll say defensive oh, purely on the basis of get Hattati. Obviously, the caveat to that is for, Hattati, for a bad chat about Hattati leaving, but it would be defensive more for me than attack because I think Hattati's got it in his locker to replace Arroyo's creativity. And there is, there's obviously a lot of moving parts. We don't know who stays, who goes, but. Who would be the option for you? Creative or defensive midfielder? Left back. <laughs> He's too his f***ing stupid. <laughs> <laughs> he can't just box us into a corner. That's it's not the, the, it's a midfield question. Forget left back, forget centre half, forget striker. In terms of well, bolster well, in the midfield. If, you, if you're putting me right in that one or the other, yes, yeah. Yeah. then we can't kick a boot the season with one striker. We need a striker. Do you thanks, know what I mean? Thanks for playing along, guys. Uh, Who would have thought I would have been the conformist? <laughs> no, voice no of reason. Uh, do you really take midfield? F- the midfield. We'll move on. <laughs> uh, just a couple of last bits of news <laughs> as we wrap things up. Uh, Adam Eder, right? We obviously know there's an ongoing thing going on there. He was booed onto the park for Norwich in a friendly against San Pauli on Saturday. I like it. Uh, very. I, I'm not a big fan of players 
throwing the toys out the pram, but it very much looks like his time at Norwich is over at least, and it should open the door, shouldn't it? I think you'll be feeling, you know, you, you just neglected me as a, as a player. You left me on the bench. I wasn't even match day squads. I managed to get a loan to go and better myself, and now you're blocking me out of that. He's, I think he's right to feel aggrieved. The numbers they're putting on him are just ridiculous. The new manager situation didn't help there, did it? Obviously no. Norwich changed coaches and the new guys are right to away. look at him. That's yeah. already away. Um, do you think he'll eventually become a Celtic player, Paddy? Do you see happening? I've, I've honestly no idea. I don't, if it's a high figure that they want, do you see it as stumping up the money? No, I don't if, think so. If they sit tight on that, no. I, I think this is one of those deals that will go right to the wire Same. because it's that cat and mouse. Ship. Cat and mouse and eventually... A, a figure will be reached that suits both parties and gets an unhappy player off Norwich's books and, and a, a much needed striker onto your books yeah but we might not get him for a few weeks time I'm Last, just glad Joey Dawson's still there gee I think he's taken a bad injury actually my uh, first, has he? have some respect has he? I think so I think oh, he's, he's he just out. signed a new contract didn't yeah, he? yeah he's out for some time oh yeah Hope you feel bad. Uh, I did. I'm not a day because he, I, I'm, I was being genuine. He's the only other striker in the yeah. books. Yeah, there's there's no one else around. Uh, the other news, and it's speaking of academy players, Francis Turley signed a new four year deal after impressing in the US tour. Tour. It was great to see. I seen his dad tweeting, you know, real kind uh, of pride there, uh, you know, back home and stuff. And that's just what you want. That this could and should have been Daniel Kelly. It doesn't look like that's going to mm-hmm. happen. But it's always exciting, Paddy, to see someone new coming through. Turley scored against Queens Park, didn't he? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last, last one. and it's it's great to see a kid like that come out his future to the club it's excellent and it's kind of something we'll be mentioning on this show um, we're, we're, we're talking about that structure obviously with our, our transfer policy but the youth set up is something that we've, we've, we have um, want to see more from as well I think both can, can work hand in hand as well um, especially in the domestic front so it's good to see that a manager did give some of those guys a run out in, in good games as well like difficult opponents um, great experience for them as well and and yeah for me uh, Anderson and I think Turley they didn't look out of place yeah I liked Anderson too I thought he looked really good so that's in week one of the season done James 4 now one top of the table once again but your final comments for the week sign some players please Celtic. sign some players Paddy sign yeah. a left back and a centre half Mav <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> We've annoyed him. Nah, sorry, sorry, sorry what, I'm, what, I'm, what I meant to say was Paddy, your own final thoughts for the week. <laughs> um, guys, can you help me, Bath, do you know? <laughs> Anything else? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Gabba Ogre. Final word to you, we'll go up a road. Uh, well, I would echo those sentiments. I think I think we just need to see what, a bit of action. <laughs> we, 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 need to see a, we need to see a bit of action. Um, I think the fans are very much buoyed by what they're seeing on the pitch and that's great you've, you've got that feel good factor installed uh, throughout the club around the playing squad and it, it reflects very well on the manager he's, he's producing the goods he's doing what he said he would do improve the players that he has get them in a style of football he wants to see and that we want to see that's happening um, you know the, the next stage is very much over to those in charge of the club overall and supporting the, the manager you know past his audition this is what I can bring you with the, with the right calibre of players. Mm-hmm. It's now down to us to provide them with the with the armour to do it. You've changed your tune when it comes to Brendan Rodgers. No, I, 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 I listen. He's doing his job. Well done. Well, well done. That's, <laughs> that's your job. Okay, massive few weeks ahead, but let's see what happens. That wraps things up on this first Celtic Exchange weekly of the new season. Thanks to James Muffin Paddy, and thanks to you for tuning in. We'll be back on Friday with a counter to kick off ahead of Sunday's game with Hibs. And remember to check out the show notes to see how you can support the Celtic Exchange throughout this season. But in the meantime, as always, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again soon.